Okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a, uh, a very good uh, morning from Alexander and myself. Um, I think we're, we're very honored uh, to have been invited um, to this conference uh, today. I, can, I think I can say that on our mutual behalf. And I think we're also very lucky um, that uh, the preceding speakers have explained why you have two Europeans on stage uh, for the topics uh, of this morning. So we're extremely grateful to them. My personal gratitude is that I'm here with Alexander because I think what we will be explaining to you is that we did have some turbulence, and quite some in Europe as well, with a very aggressive move by our antitrust regulator, the European Commission, to move into the field of IP, which in Europe is really the prerogative of the national judges. But just like, well, hopefully today's morning fog, uh, quite some of that turbulence has burned off, given that we do have a ruling by our Supreme Court, it's a matter called Huawei that you've seen um, in some of the, um, uh, the previous presentations, and we'll go through that um, in uh, our presentation. If I could ask um, our technical staff to maybe pull up um, the different presentation that we send you this morning on stick, which is a joint presentation, uh, which has my name to it. I think we can get started on that. Well, um, while we sort um, the technicalities, what we're doing in that presentation is really four things. We're setting out uh, the, um, the role of antitrust um, in IP in Europe, very briefly. Then, and here is where it's technical and where I'm particularly grateful uh, to Alexander to be up here with me. Uh, we'll be discussing the, um, the Huawei ruling. Thank you very much. So um, we'll then be discussing the Huawei ruling. Um, we're then moving to, uh, well, whether there is still um, flux um, and rather a, a set uh, presentation. Now. Um, what was the issue? Just like in India, um, we had exactly the, the issues Hemant had pointed out. There is a tension between what antitrust and IP wants to achieve, and our EU regulator felt it had to step in, and there was an extreme amount of activism by our previous competition commissioner, Commissioner Almunia, um, stating in public um, fora that he was concerned that his grandchildren would still um, um, enjoy the benefits of innovation if he, as the antitrust commissioner, wouldn't step in, and stepping in, he certainly did. Um, the reasons why our antitrust regulator was so concerned was, you know, how standardization, how friend commitments, and how really the right to judicial protection how that interferes with antitrust. And our regulator went as far as considering whether or not the mere access to the courthouse, the mere seeking of an injunction, not the exercising of an injunction that has been granted, but the mere seeking, the going to ask for judicial uh, review could already be an abuse of dominance. For uh, all clarity and transparency, I should also say that uh, we represent Samsung, and so I'm completely objective, of course, in these matters, uh, but we did have a certain position um, in uh, that whole debate. The real question was whether what we had before our antitrust regulator waltzed in, the system which essentially was built on a precedent created nationally by the national judges in Germany called the Orange Book Standard, which Alexander will explain in just a minute, whether that hadn't tilted the balance too far in terms of protecting the rights of the licensor, the holder of the SEP. The commission clearly thought that was the case and decided it would step onto what was previously held to be the domain of the national judges. The Huawei ruling that was issued in July of last year by our, well, I'll just call it our Supreme Court, at least at the EU level, um, seeks to, well, really reset the balance 
between what was the original way of looking at SCPs and the rights to an injunction as set in the national standard called Orange Book and what our European regulator, the EU Commission, had meanwhile created in two decisions, a negative finding in Motorola Mobility and a settlement decision in um, Samsung Electronics. Um, now I think I'll hand to um, Alexander because I think it's very important to set out this tension that had been created by these two fora and why it was so important when we stick to turbulence that our Supreme Court step in here. Yeah, this is um, just uh, the two models. Uh, one is the, the, the model of the European Commission. We call it the, the, the EC approach and the other one is the Orange Book approach, which uh, was law in, or let's say, was case law in Germany uh, since 2009, and uh, and most of the decisions are uh, infected, impacted by that uh, uh, orange book uh, decision. Um, so the contrast is quite uh, great between the two approaches, and I think this is important to look into this in order to understand what is. Uh, since July, since uh, our Supreme Court, I say it, uh, has rendered uh, the uh, decision in the Huawei case in order to give us a new, let's say, new guidelines in, in for the patent litigators how to, to deal with the SAP issue in patent litigation. So the European Commission simply sa said uh, it is sufficient already that uh, one side, uh, the uh, let's say the user of the, the SAP patent, shows willingness to uh, to negotiate and uh, and of course what does this mean uh, willingness to negotiate was first unclear but it was also clear that this is not workable uh, and uh, on let's say uh, during our gala dinner I had a discussion with a US colleague who said uh, under such a system he would have never um, um, recommended to his client to bring his patents under the uh, under a standard and of course standards has all have also a particular uh, function in our system, and I, I think such an uh, approach would have uh, brought many patents out of any standards because willingness to negotiate, every negotiator knows what it means uh, that someone expresses the willingness, but uh, in his mind he says, I don't want to settle, and uh, this can then uh, somehow identify it in a course of, let's say, negotiation of many, many years. So the other side now, th this was the orange book approach, uh, starting from a, not from a uh, SAP case, uh, it started from a de facto uh, 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 norm, in, but uh, the, the German case law was, uh, was applying that uh, decision uh, in all uh, the cases, also on SAP, uh, and, uh, but it was somehow um, felt unfair for the user of that, uh, let's say, the, the, the SAP patent. Because um, what makes it, uh, what are the characteristics of the Orange Book uh, procedure? The first thing is that uh, it was up to the, uh, the defendant or the user of the patent to make the front offer. So he had the burden to uh, make such an offer to the uh, owner of the SAP patent. And um, in consideration also of our proceedings in, in Germany, it was not necessary for the SAP owner to put the other side on notice prior to filing any uh, litigation case. And we know that uh, Germany is a uh, rocket docket system. You might have a hearing in Mannheim already in seven months, and if someone uh, files a lawsuit on an SAP patent in Mannheim, the other side gets into trouble because uh, they have to not only to, to uh, let's say, to, to get uh, this uh, procedure 